Good afternoon and welcome to the Toronto Reference Library. This afternoon's program is another in the Baycrest Toronto Public Library Health Programming Partnership. I am so pleased to introduce you to Dr. Tiffany Chow. And I'm so pleased to see so many of you here today, in spite of this weather. Dr. Chow is the author of The Memory Clinic, Stories of Hope and Healing for Alzheimer's Patients and Their Families. It was published by Penguin and became available a little more than a month ago. Dr. Chow describes the book this way. This book is a summary of what I've learned through my research or from my colleagues about prevention and management of dementia. Even when there is a family history of Alzheimer's disease, people at risk can do things to prevent its onset or progression. Through her grandmother, A Kwan, born in 1906 in Hawaii of, an, of Chinese ancestry, Dr. Chow has a genetic legacy of Alzheimer's. Yet her grandmother did not suffer the typical memory loss and decline of Alzheimer's disease over the years. So what did she do right? Dr. Chow probes what she and other women can do to mitigate the impact of genetics through nutrition, exercise, stress management, and through the concepts of cerebral reserve and brain plasticity. Dr. Chow is an absolute dynamo. She is a senior clinician scientist at the Baycrest Rotman Research Institute, staff behavioral neurologist at the Sam and Ida Ross Memory Clinic, and holds a dual appointment as Assistant Professor of Neurology and Geriatric Psychiatry within the University of Toronto. She studied or trained variously at Stanford, Rush Medical College, UCLA, and was Clinical Corps Director at the University of Southern California's Alzheimer Research Center. Her current research focuses on behavioral disturbances brought on by dementia, as well as their apparent opposite, apathy, and how these symptoms relate to brain chemistry as seen with functional neuroimaging. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tiffany Chow. Well, thank you all for coming to spend some time with me this afternoon in the library. It's absolutely a privilege to be making noise inside a library. Um, and this library is quite the centerpiece showpiece for the Toronto Public Library System. So it's absolutely delightful to be here. And part of why it's delightful to be here is that I have a legacy of library patronage. So what you see before you um, is the State Library of Hawaii. This is in Honolulu. It sits in a very important corner of Punchbowl and King Street. Has anybody here been to Honolulu? Yeah, oh, hey, okay, Canadians do make it all the way out there, that's good. Um, so this is the Hawaii State Library, um, and uh, it's across the street from the uh, Supreme Court. It's kitty corner from the main cemetery where all the missionaries were buried. Uh, there's now a Mission Houses Museum on that same uh, piece of land. And then on the fourth of the corners, is something called the Hale Honolulu, which is sort of like City Hall. Um, so these pictures were taken by my grandmother and they appear in a photo album from when she was 15 years old. And as you can see, she calls this very New England looking building uh, a favorite spot. She did a lot of reading, starting very early in life and continuing right on through the large print bodice ripper format of novel uh, to the day that she died. Um, and I bring that up because a lot of people want to know, should I do, do Sudoku puzzles? Should I be getting on a treadmill, etc.? Some of the recent evidence shows that reading is good for you. I will not tell you what to read because some of us like nonfiction. Some of us don't like nonfiction very much. Um, but whatever it is, reading can expand how you are encoding new information, making new associations with the data that you already have in your head, and that's a really nice way to not exercise your brain through a repetitive stimulation thing, but to expand on your repertoire. So it is not the same as going to the gym and making your muscles bigger. 
you don't really want your brain to get bigger. There's only much, so much space in your skull. What you want is for your brain to get better, right? You want it to have efficient ways of doing what you want it to do, and you want it to have backup systems so that in case something happens, fall, head trauma, dementia, you can compensate because you have three different ways to remember that one fact, or you have three different ways to organize your calendar, things like that. Okay, so reading is important. Reading is also important from the viewpoint of a statistic that you may have heard before about how educational level can be a risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia down the line. The idea behind this educational level discrimination, if you will, is that the more education you have, the more likely you are to have a cognitively challenging career or job path over life. And that will, as we were saying before, keep expanding your brain's repertoire. Having a lower level of education keeps you in perhaps job positions or uh, less plugged in social networks, which would then contribute to your vulnerability to dementia. The reading comes in in that if you, for whatever reasons, I mean, the people who are in their 80s now survived two world wars. For various reasons, they could not pursue higher education, even though they had all the smarts for it. So uh, apparently, a way to compensate for having completed nominally four, five, six years of school would be to get on the reading train. So if you already have a couple of books on your nightstand, great. If you don't, there's a lot of books in here that you can lay your hands on, right? OK, so the fact that one of grandma's top three favorite spots in her life was the library was very telling of someone who, who really did a lot of reading over time. Now, <clears throat> on a day like today here in Toronto, I thought I'd share with you how the, this Hawaii State Library looks pretty much 364 days a year, maybe one bad day. So this is their foyer, just bathed in light. And it's a stone floor, and it's actually one of the very cool places to go during most of those tropical hot days. Um, they do have a metal detector, which was uh, tastefully left out of this picture. Um, it also helps to see if the books are walking out with having been, without having been checked out. This is the atrium of the library. It's wonderful. You wander in, you get your book, you wander into the atrium, you hang out for a few hours. There are little tables and chairs so you can hook up to the wireless and just have a really good day among the books. Um, there's some wonderful artwork, and I'm not going to take the time to show you those pictures. This is my grandmother, Aquan, at age 15. I didn't get to see her like this. I never got to see her hair down. By the time I was born, she was always wearing it in a bun in the back of her head. And it's in writing this book, I had the privilege of trying to go back through her life and get to know what she did, because the big question on my mind has been, OK, so what did she do that the rest of us should be doing? She didn't know it at the time this picture was taken. She was probably just worried about falling off the dock into the water. But later in her life, at age 86, grandpa would come and say, OK, it's time for us to go to so-and-so's memorial service. And she would say to him, you know what, I'm not quite done with the freezing of the mangoes. And I'm a little bit tired, so I'm going to let you go. And I'll just be here when you get back. He left when he came back. She was asleep on the living room floor. So she hadn't gotten very far when, bang, she had had a bleeding in the brain, a hemorrhage. And the amount of blood was quite sizable. And that caused her to lose consciousness. And she never woke up again. She stayed alive for another couple of weeks in the hospital bed. Uh, but she was actually, for all intents and purposes, asleep, comfortable. That kind of bleeding in a person age 86 is 99.99% usually due to amyloid, the beta amyloid form that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, lodging in the small arteries of the brain, taking away from the flexibility of those arteries until one day the plumbing breaks and you have a large bleed. So that's bad news, good news. The bad news is grandma had beta amyloid of Alzheimer's disease and to enough of an extent that it led to this hemorrhage. The good news is, 
up until that day, she was freezing the mangoes from their tree in the garden. She was walking with Grandpa to the library to read the newspapers. She was going to the supermarket to get lamb chops, and sometimes they'd run into Jack Lord and his wife when they were doing that. So a full life lived right up till its very end. And so what I'm trying to relate to you guys here today and in the book is that there are things that are going to happen to our brains as we age that it's going to be hard for us to have control over. But the important thing is not to die without any amyloid in your brain. The important thing is to build yourself up, build up that repertoire so that you can compensate should there be something like amyloid collecting in your brain. There is a type of neuroimaging called PIB-PET. There's another one called Amavid, which is coming to Toronto, at least on a research basis. If you do this scan, it will tell you how much amyloid you have in your brain now. You don't have to wait till you die and give up your brain for autopsy. It actually gives you a sense of how much there is and which parts of the brain have this amyloid deposition. I do not encourage you, even if you're worried about Alzheimer's disease, to get this scan done because there are a bunch of people who are elderly walking around among us. I will not name them because I can't. But they have a lot of amyloid, but they're doing just fine, thank you very much. So we want to be either the lucky people who don't have any amyloid or those people who just have amyloid as part of whatever they're programmed for genetically as an aging person, and they're doing OK. Amyloid is not the only protein you're trying to, to avoid. Different types of dementia have different types of protein buildups. And amyloid is not the only protein in Alzheimer's disease that might lead to difficulty with your memory or with other cognitive functions. OK, so let's move on in grandma's life. Now, why was she into the library? That wasn't a very typical thing for a Chinese immigrant. I'm showing here the Green family, missionaries who came on some of the earliest, uh, one of the earliest boats. The Reverend Green had several children, and he was a big supporter of education. There were several missionaries who wanted to make sure that they were able to teach the Bible's messages, but also literacy and some degree of industrial skills like harvesting wheat. Um, oh, what do I need to do here? Quit? I guess I'm going to quit. Um, in this case, Reverend Green decided, you know what? It's great to educate the boys, but if we don't educate the girls, we're going to be limited. So he started a girls' school on the island of Maui and got busted by the missionary headquarters in New England. They said, we did not mandate this. Uh, he said, well, you know, I wrote to you about a year and a half ago about starting this school, and you didn't respond, and I had the resources in order, so we just started to do it. And they said, you know what? You're going to be blackballed. So very, very tough life as missionaries there. You try to do a lot of good, um, but you were under the sway of people who were providing the, um, the food, money, and other supplies that you might need in order to build your schools, uh, et cetera. So, this family, uh, the children of Reverend Green, uh, grew up both on Maui and on Oahu in Honolulu. The three sisters, the three Green sisters, were all significantly older. Let me see if I can point this out to you. We're all significantly older than Aquan. Their family had actually hired her dad, my great grandfather, as the cook. And apparently, what each of the missionary grand houses in Honolulu was doing was to create a compound, not just a home, but a compound where the staff could also live. My great-grandfather had 10 children. There was not enough room in the Green's house for his whole family to live, so they made a deal. They built him a house down the street, about a half a mile down the road, and he, his wife, and the boys all lived there, and the girls were invited to live in the house of the missionaries. Carrie Green, one of the three sisters, even though she was much older than Aquan, was very interested in seeing how Aquan could learn. And they did the equivalent of homeschooling with her, got her into shape, got her interested in books. Carrie Green was one of the first librarians at the Hawaii State Library when it opened 100 years ago, February 1st. 
So you can understand why Aquan spent time there. It was a ride home. <laughs> but also, um, she was very interested in the subject matter. So that's Aquan on her wedding day. Looks like anybody else, right? Real cute. Again, little did she know what was in store. At the time that she got married, she'd finished her high school education, and she was working as a kindergarten teaching assistant. Um, she had also worked for the Humane Society, and you know, there's a third place. She was on her way to becoming uh, not only a mother, but also uh, a worker at the equivalent of Toronto Hydro. This picture is of that green family. They all kept in touch with grandma through letter writing. So these ladies would have gone to town on email or blogging because they were constantly typing up their opinions and impressions in very cute, roaring 20s, flapper type language. Um, so here is grandma, and this is my mom way back when. Uh, a reunion of the Greens uh, and their husbands and children. This is Grandma. Uh, so she was working at the Honolulu Board of Water Supply, and one of her jobs was to write for the newsletter for all the employees, to keep each other up on births of children, people's retirement, things like that. So she was plugged in. She knew what was happening with everybody and was happy to tell their stories in this newsletter. Have, has anybody heard of the Nun study with regard to Alzheimer's disease? Quite a few of you. So w there have been many wonderful findings from the Nun study. They call it the Nun study because uh, an, a Catholic order of nuns, uh, and also I think priests, um, volunteered to participate in a study where at the ends of their lives, and, and usually when you're in the order, you will go to that order's nursing home after you've retired from active nun work in the convent. Uh, and, you, and then after they died, they allowed for their brains to go to autopsy at Rush University in Chicago, which is actually where I went to medical school. Although I had no idea this was going on in the background while I was a medical student. In any case, what they had access to, in addition to the nuns' brains, was records that had been kept by the convent from the very earliest application to become a novice. And one of the early reports from that study that came out in the 90s was so intriguing. They took those essays, which were supposed to be limited to one or two pages, and they looked at the style of writing to approximate the intelligence slash educational level and literacy of each of these applicants. And they used a very complicated scoring procedure. And in the book, I actually subjected grandma's newsletter articles to some of this counting up. And interestingly, although I would have imagined that she would have a high score, because high scores turned out to correlate with protection against showing Alzheimer's symptoms in this study, grandma had just kind of a plain old average score. So there must have been something else besides that level of literacy. So this picture is from one of the uh, Board of Water Supplies annual parties. They have a moo moo contest. So you got to make your own muumuu, which is generally a long dress. And she kept winning time after time because she would put, she would embroider slogans that the, the company was using that year onto the hamline of the muumuu. So she was multifaceted. She would sew, knit, crochet for all the neighbors. So there were many skills. There was always something going on. And she was engaging with other people through these talents and skills. So again, social networks becoming more and more important as you see papers coming out in a publication in the last three years. What is a social network? We think of Facebook these days. To a certain extent, you are interacting with other people. But it's even more complex when you're with that person face to face. You have to decide, what are our boundaries? What are we trying to do together? Maybe we're not trying to do something together. And I need to tell you in a very gentle way that Yes, and now we've had our time together. I wish you well. All of these things are very challenging for the brain. What's the biggest lobe in your brain? What takes up the most room inside your skull? The one in the front, the frontal lobe. What does the frontal lobe like to do? Social skills, right? So if you want to affect one of the largest sections of your brain, do things that the frontal lobe does. 
That is, adjusting your demeanor and your behavior to be appropriate to the people around you. And of course, that's culturally determined. And also, usually for people it's on the left side, your left frontal lobe helps you to give narrative. I'm not just listing a whole bunch of junk. I'm actually weaving a story for you. And the most popular stories, the stories that endure, have a beginning, an introduction, some kind of conflict, some resolution of the conflict, and an end. And it's very interesting. When you talk to elderly people, you can get a sense of how that narrative is going. How many of you have listened to someone who just keeps on in the introduction section? So there's about 50 characters in this story, and I have too many to juggle in my head to follow you to get to the conflict, if there is a conflict. Or maybe there's never a conflict. There's just these 50 people who keep wafting in and out of the story, so then there's never going to be an end. It's very interesting. And so some of the work that has to do with how the frontal lobe is doing as we age has to do with the consistency of your narrative. All right, this is the love of my grandmother's life. My grandfather was one of the first US postal carriers who A, was not white, B, transitioned from the horse-drawn carriage to an actual automotive. <laughs> Ooh, his, his horse-drawn carriage was in an accident with a car. It made news in Honolulu. Um, so he actually worked with the US Postal Service till he died. He only had a seventh grade level of education and he called my grandmother the smart one, which as a husband was probably really wise, right? Happy wife, happy life. Um, the thing about grandpa that gave me a sense of his overall intelligence is that he did the stock market. This guy who came from no money, Chinese immigrant into Hawaii, kind of a dark-skinned Chinese guy, so everybody always thought he was Filipino. Hey, your husband's a good Filipino guy. He did the stock market. He invested in stuff like Sears and Post Cereal before anybody knew what they were. So they retired with quite a bit of money. He was up at what time, Hawaii time, would it be to check in with the opening of the New York Stock Exchange. He was up at an ungodly hour, listening to what's going on, doing his weekly trades, going off to work, or organizing the errands of the day, um, and helping Grandma keep on track a little bit because she was so plugged in with everybody else. He needed to remind her uh, house, need to do this, the garden's all in disarray. They had a ton of plants. They had macadamia nut trees, papaya trees, mango trees, and all kinds of blossoming bushes so that she could make lays for people's special occasions. It was an incredibly full life for both of them. She died at 86. He was significantly older. He was 95 when she died. They had been together for 75 years at the time that she died. When she was in her coma, all he could say to me was, we've known each other for 75 years. Most older couples that have been together for that long usually pass away within a year of each other. I think you've heard that statistic before. Why is that? It has to do with loss of the hub of your life, maybe loss of your social network, if you were counting on the other person to bring you into the circle. It has to do with you're old. You actually have death as a common outcome within the next 12, 12 months anyway. Grandpa hung in there for 14 more months, and he was as sharp as a tack. So between the two of them, I think my mom probably got some really good genes for what's going on. But genes are not everything. When people introduce me, the, the boilerplate says Tiffany has a genetic legacy through her grandmother. Yeah, I do and I don't. What really counts is what you're doing with those genes, right? Has anybody read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell? OK, just about as many as know the Nun study, but not exactly the same people, except in a couple of cases. Um, so what Malcolm Gladwell says as part of Outliers is that you've got these people with these superhuman IQs, but they don't all do well. Why is that? Isolated. Isolated could be a big chunk of this. Thank you for listening to that social network piece. Very important. Sometimes when you're really good at one thing, you're really bad at everything else. So it's nice to have more of a diversified portfolio. There are actually eight types of intelligence. There's the verbal IQ, which runs the main um, 
numbers for what your general IQ is going to be reported as, but there's other things like understanding of the physical, natural aspects of the world, knowing where you are in space, knowing about how you're doing emotionally. That's an internal emotional quotient, internal EQ. Then there's I can socialize with 100 people and make friends with all of them. That's a different kind of emotional quotient. So we've all got strengths and weaknesses. Some of us have strengths that are stronger than the average, but we all have strengths and weaknesses. One of the things that we worry about when we're testing people for cognition and whether they have dementia or not is to make sure that we're testing you fairly based on your strengths and weaknesses. If you were always bad at math, don't give me the math test because at baseline, I'm failing them. Give me something else like a verbal task and I can generally do it. And if I can't do it that day, then that may be a significant clinical signal. Okay? Um, let's see. What, uh, how are we doing on time here? It's only 1.30. I know people generally have a lot of thoughts and questions about this subject. So I'm hoping that I've answered them all in the book, but since you have me for another hour here, why don't I open it up for questions? Please step up to the mic because we are taping the session and it'll help the listeners if they can actually hear the question as well as the answer. If you need to speak from your seat, that's okay. I will repeat your question into the mic up here. Anybody have a strong opinion, an anecdote, or a question? I see somebody making his way over. The man in the green shirt is a little bit faster on the fly. Come on in. Mike's not on yet. Jennifer? Try now. I can hear you, so I can repeat your question if it takes us a while to get the mic going. <laughs> okay, nice short question. Thank you. A good exemplar. So the question is about this word called neuroplasticity. It's only recently that we've realized that it isn't just kids who can make some adaptations in terms of how their brains are completing tasks or what part of the brain is being used to do a task. So now we know that it actually continues through life. It continues for a little bit longer in some people than others, and part of the research has to do with identifying what is it that can enhance that neuroplasticity. So part of the enhancement of the neuroplasticity is whatever we are doing that will en enhance that repertoire. That's how these two things are related. Um, so when you read, you are actually enhancing to a certain degree some neuroplasticity, especially if you read outside of your comfort zone. I did a really interesting medical student interview, person applying to medical school, and I said, so what do you do in your free time? And this is a hyper-organized person. He said, well, for my mind, I play chess. For my physical exercise, I do frisbee. And I also have another category, which is something outside of my comfort zone. And I really liked that. There's, if you go to Lululemon, there's all kinds of slogans that are on the window and all that stuff. And one of those slogans is, do something that's dangerous, or do something new, or do something scary. They don't mean risk your life. What they mean is get outside of your comfort zone, because novelty turns the brain's juices on. There are different kinds of chemicals that are released that enhance neuroplasticity or enable neuroplasticity. Brain-derived neurotropic factor is one of them. Exercise actually increases the amount of that that's floating around. And that's sort of like putting a miracle Grow on the tendrils of your brain to get it to connect up better. Again, you don't want the brain to just get bigger. You don't need a big, heavy brain. What you need is a really connected brain that's connecting in novel ways over time. Next question. Hi, Mrs. Chai. I'd like to um, thank you for your education and being an intelligent person, but I suffer from schizoaffective disease. Will this um, Alzheimer's affect me in the future, or how can I go out by it with my brain, chemical balance in my brain? Thank you for sharing from your own personal story. There are mood disorders that put people at risk for getting cognitive impairment later in life. Affective disorders include mood disorder, uh, sorry, uh, include depression and anxiety. There's a much higher rate of Alzheimer's disease development in people who have recurrent depression over a lifetime. Those people who have one episode of depression that is then treated 
generally do a little bit better than those who have recurrent depression. So very important to follow up on it if, a, if your family doctor were to suggest that, mm, you know, you seem like you've been down for more than six months, the thing that got you down in the first place has resolved, but you still aren't able to activate your concentration, your energy is low, you don't feel as engaged in things, we should look into this depression thing. So that's one important message. Now, the schizo part of schizoaffective, schizophrenia itself does not necessarily lead to a change in your cognition late in life. This is a really juicy question. Thank you for asking it. I've been doing work with people at CAMH, and we looked at the white matter of the brain. So you've got gray matter is the cortex on the outside, and white matter is all those connecting lines that need to communicate signal from this area over to this area or from this area over to this area. People with schizophrenia have a slight difference in how that white matter looks. Some of that is from birth. Some of that gets exacerbated over time. And that baseline change difference in the white matter contributes to some difficulties in multitasking or in creating a narrative or other frontal lobe functions. But those disabilities, those impairments, don't necessarily get worse with age. So the schizophrenia has one story and the depression has another story. We still have one more affective disorder to talk about, which is anxiety disorders. Within anxiety disorders, there's panic attacks and there's post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of interesting work coming out of post-traumatic stress disorder studies. The type of stress and anxiety that you feel when you have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, activates cortisol release. Cortisol is a great chemical. You wouldn't be anywhere without it. But when you have too much of it for too long, it actually acts to, uh, it acts against, it acts to shrink the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the deep underside of your brain that is sort of the first way station for new information. Those are the people that you want as receptionists who can file and cross-reference. So hippocampus, very important. Post-traumatic stress disorder, very difficult on the hippocampus. Some indication that depression also has some wear and tear on the hippocampus. And this may make the hippocampus itself vulnerable to a certain extent. Then if you have additionally changes of Alzheimer's disease and you get really old, it's a triple whammy and it may be hard to compensate for over time. Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. Hey, I was wondering if you have any more uh, practical tips in terms of maybe diet or um, different uh, practices. You know what? I'm going to step sort of... over and grab my book so I can look at the table of sure, contents sure. and we can go through each of those. Yeah, just to like uh, prevent it or look. slow it down if it's already set in. Okay. All right. So, so that's two different questions. They're both very important. One is, I'm well now. How do I prevent things later? And the other question is, I have been diagnosed. What can I do to slow down the progression? To the best of our ability today, maybe we'll have more to say in 10 years, both things work, or, or, or the things I'm about to mention will work in both circumstances. And I'll try to be clear when that's different. So uh, I actually i am so glad that they made me do a table of contents because at a time like this, I can refer to it. It's a little bit of a cheat sheet for me. So uh, chapter seven, managing stress. Manage the stress that you're going through as a worried well person. Manage the stress that the patient is going through. You notice I say do not eliminate stress. You can't. Just the fact that we have to go back outside sometime later today is stressful. Um, there's good stress. I'm planning a wedding. It's still stressful. It still might keep you up late at night. And then there's the stress that you didn't expect that happens and you need to learn how to manage it. The reason why, or one easy reason why, is because the more stress you are going through, the more cortisol you're releasing, cortisol related to the hippocampus, right? So in a, in a couple of sentences, that's one important point. There's a lot in the book about if your stress as a worried well person is coming to you as a caregiver, what can you do? 
Dementia takes a long time to unfold. After the time a person is diagnosed, you've got another 10 years maybe before this person passes away, maybe not even from this illness. Just because you have Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, it doesn't mean you can't have a heart attack or you can't have a stroke or you can't be hit by a car when you're crossing the street. All the same, for caregivers, there's so many things they want to do. There's so many things that they feel they should do. But we need to manage those expectations so that they can feel satisfied at the end of each day that they did the best they could for the patient. So it is not the caregiver's job. These are things that I often will need to tell them at appointments when they come in with the patient. It's not your job to scan the internet every day to try to find the latest breakthrough. A lot of the latest breakthrough headlines are great if you're a venture capitalist looking for something to invest in, but it won't lead to something that's on the shelf at your local pharmacy for another 15 years. By that time, the patient will either be too far advanced to benefit from the drug, or that person may already have passed away. So let's save your time and energy for other things that won't stress you out as much. What does the caregiver really need to do, basically, every day? Caregiver needs to do what he or she can to keep the patient feeling safe, pain-free, like they had some pleasurable moment in the day. Note the very vagueness of that description. That could be, I got to sit with the cat and nobody bothered me for a whole hour. Or, I got to sit in my favorite sunny place and listen to my favorite music. Or it could be, I baked cookies with the grandchildren. Maybe they were doing more of the baking than I was, but it's something I used to do all the time, and this is great, and it smells wonderful. And so, all of these good signals are going off. The fourth item, so we had pain-free, safe, do something that's pleasurable. And the fourth thing, for as long as possible, is that the person should be able to have some sort of autonomy a choice in what's going on. One of the things that people are afraid of with institutionalization or being placed in a nursing home is that they lose all control and personhood. It's the family member's prerogative to inform the staff at the nursing home, you know what, she really likes a piece of chocolate before she goes to bed. Here's a whole bag of chocolates. If you could make that happen, we'll do it whenever we're here, but if you could make that happen, that would just mean so much for just a simple gesture. And most staff are really happy to do that when it's made so obvious and simple. So that's about managing stress as a caregiver. If you are able to hit all those buttons for the patient, in most cases, the patient doesn't care as much as the caregiver or family does about the memory loss or not being able to tell you exactly what day or date it is. They just want to feel comfortable and accepted the way they are. Don't give me your bad tone when you walk in the door because I did something, sorry, I guess, I don't know, I'm confused, what do you want? It's very difficult for caregivers to not react when something negative has happened with the patient. But to the extent possible, you've got to use your sense of humor, you've got to use your sense of equanimity. Okay, you know what? The bad news is there's a real mess in the kitchen. The good news is she didn't hurt herself, she didn't fall, and it looks like she actually wanted to make cookies today. She hasn't wanted to do this for a few years. So that's all good. All right, so kind of long-winded, chapter seven. Chapter eight, what you eat. There's all kinds of great advice about what you should eat and what you should not eat, so I can't tell it all to you here because then I'll put us right on up to 4.30. In general, I would say anything that Michael Pollan, P-O-L-L-A-N, has written, you should read. It's actually good nonfiction, readable nonfiction. Yeah, I got, a, I got a fan over here. So did you see the Eater's Manual? Okay, the latest thing is the Eater's Manual. I think, and Jackie can straighten me out on this, I think the publishers have been telling Michael Pollan that the general public would like a shorter book. Fewer words, Michael, it's all good, but what can you do for people who wanna read something while they're in the bathroom? And that's the Eater's Manual. There's like one sentence on a page, and then on the back of the page, if you're interested, you can get the whole explanation of it. But examples of this would be, eat more leafy greens. If you did that, if I did that, you're getting all the antioxidants and vitamin Bs and blah, blah, blahs that people keep telling you you should have. And as your mother probably told you once upon a time, this is the way you should do it. Should you boil it? Should you steam it? Should you eat it raw? Just don't overcook it, and you're, you're good to go. Other things, don't eat too much fat. 
tough for us meat eating carnivores, but a hard fact of life. Secondly, or thirdly, you don't have to have that much protein. Based on your hand that you see before you, how much of your hand, the volume, is your daily allotment of protein, after which it turns to fat? Yeah, the palm of your hand. This is smaller than one of the husband, my husband-sized hamburgers. This is really bad news for me, but it's a good guideline. I do not hit this guideline every day, but I aspire to it. The other part of managing your stress is to forgive yourself when you screw up a little bit, because you always have tomorrow to try to get better. So those are a few things about diet. Diet is important because the more body fat you got and the weirder your eating habits with glycemic rushes, the more you're going to have problems managing insulin. Insulin, with each passing year, seems more and more directly related to Alzheimer's disease risk. Now, some of you are going to be genetically blessed, and this will never be an issue for you. However, for almost all of us, you probably noticed over the course of life that your metabolism changed, right? Like you could eat like whatever you wanted up until you were 25, and then suddenly something happened. Well, that's metabolism, that's insulin, and it has some direct relations to the chemistry of what's going on in Alzheimer's disease. So pay attention to that. Um, more people should be switching over to more vegetables and fruits and in five smaller portions a day as opposed to three large feed bag uh, incidents uh, per day. I told my husband that and he wasn't happy with me, but we're working on it. Um, now, physical activity is chapter nine. We talked a little bit about how exercise can enhance neuroplasticity indirectly by increased release of brain-derived neurotropic factor. The other thing, there's many things about exercise that are good for you. One of them, though, is that it helps to bring you into social circumstances. Unless you're exercising by yourself in the ba basement, which is okay, you're generally gonna meet other people doing what you're doing, or you're gonna take a class. So you can do a twofer, right? You can do something, a new type of exercise. Novelty and exercise, highly recommended. If you belong to a gym, Drop in on one of those classes that you never thought you'd end up in. You don't have to take it ever again if you hate it, but try it. You might like it. How much exercise is enough exercise? Generally, the reports are coming back. You want to do at least three times a week, at least 20 minutes each time. Some people say go for a whole hour if you're only doing three times a week of something as rigorous as walking quickly. So how many of you get on the stationary bike with something to read? and you're going at a very comfortable pace and you're not breaking a sweat. That doesn't count. I guess I'm only talking about myself. But, so I gotta actually lift up the book every once in a while to see if I'm hitting 70 to 80 rotations per minute. Otherwise, I'm really just reading a book. Which again, is okay. I'm not gonna hate myself just for reading the book, but if I want the twofer, I really gotta work for it. Social networks we've already talked about. Um, and those are the main, the main things. Um, Head trauma is a risk factor for dementia. I don't know if you saw, it comes out in my journals, medical journals, before it comes out in the lay press generally, but they've been studying NFL, National Football League alumni. And the criterion was you had to get two years worth of paychecks from the NFL to qualify. A huge number of those people get Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, or other dementias, earlier in their life than other people in the general population who get those diseases. So there's something about the smacks that makes you vulnerable. So my stepsons, they have these bike helmets that were, I'm sure they were cheap, but they slosh all around back and forth. That's not like wearing a bike helmet. So bought new bike helmets. Can't keep people from falling, but if they're gonna do stuff, where they're likely to fall, let's keep them protected. They'll give them a leg up in terms of prevention later on. All of these things that I was just talking about have good effects in terms of you've got dementia already and you're trying to keep from slipping too fast. Do not hide the person with dementia. There are patients who have a dementia that causes them to behave in ways that are difficult for the other people around them. We need to help, we as a healthcare team, need to help you either with pharmacology or tips on what are the right social circumstances so that that person doesn't become isolated, shut down, immobile, unhappy, unsafe, feeling some sort of pain, whether it's emotional or physical, 
because those are the things that drive cognitive function down. Okay? Thank you. All right. Hi. Have you ever come across any research on the effects to the brain of the uh, microwave radiation emitted by cordless phones, Wi-Fi, and baby monitors? Okay, so the way in which I came across this information, total disclaimer, is that I was once living in a condo on Queen Street West, and there was a bid from Rogers to put one of those um, telephone towers for cell phone and wireless and television signal transmission. And I... One of the residents who was going to be right underneath the tower was saying, whoa, 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 I want some numbers and facts and figures about what's going on here. We haven't been able, there have been some reports of associations drawn between proximity to the tower and brain tumor formation. Haven't seen anything on dementia specifically. When we were talking to the powers that be about putting this transmission tower on top of the condo, interestingly, they pay you a lot of money to put that tower up. So you're dealing with an economic consideration, not just a safety issue. And disappointingly, the people who are supposed to give the information about the science of what's happening to people are the same people who want to put up the tower. So I think it is an issue that needs exploration. What we ended up doing that sounded more third party impartial was to have a third party come in and measure the amount of radiation, magnetic exposure, or otherwise unobservable electric current that was going on on our floor of the building. We were all at the top of the building. And interestingly, um, and it makes sense when I think about, you know, when you draw a radio tower, you have these, these concentric circles above it and things are going that way. If you're right underneath the tower, as this woman was, you have the least exposure. The farther you get away from the tower, but still within the building, the more you have. But According to these measurements, we were still way under the annual exposure limits. So, as my friend Dr. Joe says at McGill, he has a wonderful website that is not devoted specifically to this, but to this and all kinds of other things that are considered to be toxic. The dose is everything. A lot of anything is probably bad for you. We are not sure how much of a dose finally becomes bad for brain, or kidneys. I remember in the early days when we all had five pagers to wear, um, I was wearing them on my belt, and one of my patients came up in San Diego and said, you're burning out your kidneys. Quick, take those things off. Put them somewhere else. And it kind of made sense. I mean, there's something about current. We use current in uh, some of our complementary medicines, like acupuncture. Has anybody had acupuncture with amoxification? There's some sense that what you're doing is you're changing the polarity of different channels in the body is if you pass yourself through various currents, x-ray fields, etc., it's going to have an effect, but we don't know what it is yet. So to the extent that I understand a radio tower on top of the place where I'm living, it sounds like it's actually safe based on the current level of knowledge. However, I'm open to the fact that not using your hands free and actually sticking the thing up to your head might do something. I have not, actually, there have been more accidents in the old days when cell phones had a t an antenna. There were more injuries from the antenna being poked into the ear than brain tumors. So, long answer, not exactly helpful, but that's everything I know. There's more to know. Hi, um, I just had a question about exercise, but you got into a very interesting area, and I wanted to talk about, you know, there was some research done that's being done related to cell phone usage and, you know, its ability to trigger some sort of brain cancer. Um, do you know if there's any conclusive evidence to that effect or still... Sorry, one? cell phone usage and what's the other? Brain cancer. And brain cancer. So the, the answer was they have not been able to link it up. Okay. It is not only the cell phone makers who have done the research or funded the research. There have been independent people researching it. There's a Dr. Joe... I'm blanking on his last name. He's in my book. Wait a minute. Um, his last name begins with an S. He's got a website that's run out of McGill, and it answers these questions in an updated way. Joe Schwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-C-Z. Go there with these questions, and he's, he actually has graduate students that update the, the website very frequently. And uh, the question I actually had was yes. about exercise. 
Uh, does it matter what's the optimal time you choose to exercise? Because most of the times I get off work very late and I would go to the gym at 11. Uh -huh. Is that harmful in any way? Is Did it harmful? No, not okay. harmful, but the general rule of thumb, when I say to people do something new or go outside of your comfort zone, how far is too far? So let's take that pain-free, safe, do something pleasant, have autonomy. Take those four basic concepts and put it on the worried well person. You need to feel safe, happy, healthy, and loved somehow, some way, every day. If your routine is keeping you from that because it's so stressful, like, oh, I got to go to the gym, and then I got to get home before midnight, otherwise I'm not going to see any of my family, it's not, it's not the right balance for you. Now, in terms of the exact amount of time that you need to be exercising, it depends on what you're doing and also your body makeup. So if you're an athletic body type, your VO2 max, the way you uh, use oxygen efficiently, may allow you to crank it up and do 15 minutes real hard sprint and you're done. Whereas I'm on the bike with my book, as you will recall, going kind of like 50 instead of 70 and then I realize, oh, got to start making dinner at home. So if you are really present with your exercise and you only have 15 or 20 minutes, you can make it work for you. Some people find, even though they're really athletic, that they go to the yoga studio and they're sweating like pigs after the first five minutes. Yoga can be very hard for some people. Does that make it something that they should do? Not necessarily. I have friends who are so type A that they would give themselves a heart attack trying to slow down in order to fit in with the class. However, the thing that I do recommend about yoga or tai chi or even ballet, if you are so inclined, is the stretching, the flexibility, and maintaining elasticity. As you get older, in addition to wanting to have your brain intact, you want to be able to have good balance. You want to be able to bounce back from a fall. And where does that come from? It doesn't come from my slow bike riding thing. It's from stretching and making sure that I have good core strength so that if my foot goes out that way on the ice in the slush, the rest of my body compensates without now throwing my back out. And when you don't have a back, you're automatically 85 years old, right? So all those things are the really important parts of the exercising. I'm glad you've got it on your mind as something to do, but don't let it stress you out that you have to go exercise. That takes all the fun out of it. As an add-on to that, if any of you are interested in participating in clinical trials, whether you have a diagnosis or not, the way you can look for one in this neighborhood or anywhere within flying or training dis distance is clinicaltrials, all one word, dot gov. You put in the diagnosis that you're interested in or that you have and the city, and it'll tell you whatever's going on nearby. Hi, I have a question about, um, well, I think the focus that I'm always hearing for Alzheimer's is on memory loss. And I'm wondering also about the effect on personality, logic, reasoning, and not only how one can deal with that oneself, but also as a caregiver, how one can deal with it and be compassionate around right. that. Thank you. Chapters 10 through 12 of the book will give you the detailed answer to that question, but um, I'm glad you brought up the fact that Alzheimer's disease is not just about memory. You actually can't be diagnosed with a dementia unless you have at least two cognitive domains impaired. Memory is one cognitive domain. Organizational function, multitasking, attentional processes are another domain. Personality and social skills is another domain. And the symptoms that you see usually depend not on the diagnosis, but what parts of the brain have been affected. So the earliest Alzheimer's disease part of the brain affected is the hippocampus, and that's why memory gets all of the limelight when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. But it also then affects temporal lobes, which handle language and some degree of that personality and skill, uh, social skill management. And it can go towards parietal lobes, which handle how you're doing in space, where is the car parked in the uh, mall? Or where is the bathroom within the house that I've been living in for the last 20 years? If it goes to the frontal lobes more rapidly, then you're going to see the degradation of personality, temperament. Um, 
obsessive compulsive features, things like that. So absolutely, an important thing to know is that just because you have Alzheimer's disease and memory loss doesn't mean that you're exempt from all these other developments. Some of these behavioral changes are very difficult. Some of them are delusions and hallucinations. Some of them have to do with, I fly off the handle easily when, uh, when something different happens. I don't like novelty. Um, I don't recognize you, and you're scaring me because I don't recognize you, and there's an eruption. These are very difficult to manage. Sometimes they require, well, many times they require medication. So you work with the healthcare team to identify exactly what is the trigger so that they can recommend the right thing. But there's also a lot of non-pharmacological management that's important. And the, uh, the sense of flew off the handle is too general for us to help you well. We can make anybody fall asleep that we want to. But what you don't want is somebody who's asleep all day long. You want somebody who's going to have some level of quality of life and function. Am I doing all right with sound? You're, you've got your hand at your neck. I'm OK? All right. Um, so in the last two years, the people in social sciences have really done a good job of educating some of the healthcare professionals that there's such a thing as a responsive behavior. Responsive behavior is, I can no longer tell you that I'm hungry, but I'm going to act in a different way to try to get that across to you. Being uncooperative or breaking something or doing something that you don't want me to do. And it is very tricky but important for the people close to the patient to identify, you know what, he only does this when it's getting to be 11.30 and maybe he needs a snack at 11 instead of waiting till the program lunchtime at noon. So the long complicated answer to your question has to do with identifying exactly what seems to trigger the behavior that's difficult. And that will help us to help you to creatively and hopefully non-pharmacologically manage the situation. But there's lots of different tips. I think I have on the uh, recommended reading page some of the places to go for that, but it's also discussed in here. Okay. I want to have everyone join me in thanking Dr. Chow for an amazing presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>